Buonasera. It's a great pleasure to be back in Modena, albeit virtually. Thanks, Daniela, for the nice opening words. The biggest thing I will regret of not actually being in Modena with all of you uh, is that we won't be able to have a nice dinner together, which is, of course, always the, the crowning part of, of the gig in, in Italy. So I'm speaking to you virtually today about, um, yeah, the, the digital future. Uh, I, I want to start with saying one thing, you know, I think right now things are really, really pretty tough, I think, for anybody, especially in Italy. And yet, my opening statement will be that the future is better than we think. And I will explain it to you why that is and why it could be uh, if we make the right decisions. You can use right here, if you're watching on YouTube or LinkedIn or Twitch or wherever you're watching, you can use the comment bar. There's my, uh, my dear uh, fellow futurist Soha Rashid, she's going to answer the comments and I will take some questions at the end. And I do have a special surprise for you at the end, a gift. You know, it's Sunday after all, right? Got to have gifts on Sunday. So uh, that's coming right, right up and uh, let's dive right in, right? First, I think, you know, it's quite clear we are currently on a bit of a corona coaster, right? And don't be afraid when I fade out, I will come back. You know? It's basically... The emotional stress of going up and down and things are constantly changing. I mean, I'm in the same position than many of you. It's like we don't know what's going to happen next week. We have to turn around. We have to find strength with each other. And, you know, the other day I had a great conversation with other futurists about how we are feeling about our speaking, where it's going. The Corona Coaster is here to stay and we need to support each other. Uh, we need to figure out, I think, at least for the next year and a half as to what is happening and where we are going. And here's a short forecast on this, right? This is from uh, McKinsey analysis saying, you know, no matter how you look at this chart, <laughs> it's really quite clear. It's going to be until the end of 21, maybe 22 in the Eurozone until we have some semblance, not of normal, but of the next normal. And, and it's, you know, it's really quite clear that this we're in for the long haul, right? This is an L shape, regardless of the vaccine. Uh, and the economic recession will be felt in the next years. I think if you're a millennial around 25 years old, some of you may be online watching this, this is a, a very big event. It's not like the financial crash. It's not like Fukushima. It's not even like September 11th. Uh, I think it's a, a huge cut and also a huge opportunity as we go into this future. I mean, basically COVID-19 has been a giant accelerator for technology. And most of that is good, not all of it is good, but take a look, right? Remote working, yeah, all of you know what that is. Telemedicine, that has exploded. You know, people go on the doctor virtually. E-commerce, online entertainment, remote learning. I mean, basically, technology is the winner of this whole crisis. Uh, where we're meeting through here, but does it mean because technology is everywhere that we're gonna stop thinking about actually coming together, hugging each other? having food together? I don't think so. I think th these are hybrid approaches that we're going to see in the future. Very, very important that we don't give up on this. You know, this is probably going to come back in some way or the other. But as CEO of Microsoft said the other day, Satya Nadea, you know, we have seen three months, in three months, the innovation of uh, the last, in six months, the innovation of the last six, three years, right? I mean, the amount of transformation. Consumers have changed everything in their life, work, shopping, learning, live at home, the list goes on, you can see it here, right? It's basically, when we look back, we probably have never changed as much as the last six months as to how we do things. You know, I have a neighbor who's 75 years old, he didn't even know what Uber was, you know, the, the taxi service, the on-demand service. And the other day, he keeps telling me that all he eats now is Uber Eats. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yes, okay, this is how we're changing. Right? It's a different narrative, different story. And this is the header, right? Tell her anything, remote everything. And remote everything is really practical. It's cost efficient. It's starting to work. But is it human? I think it's heaven and hell at the same time. If you do a lot of Zoom calls, you know what hell looks like when you're sitting on that all day look, looking at the green light, you know, trying to come up with a fancy head that you can put on, uh, which you can now do on Zoom. Uh, but I'll spare you on that one. But it's, on the one hand, it's a great thing. You know, we all love it. But on the other hand, we're saying, I can't actually meet with real people. And, and this may also be a question of age, of course. I think if you're 15 and a gamer, this is what you do. Right? But yes, yeah, so we have to be a little bit careful about this. And, you know, the world is, to an extent, upside down. Right? Things that used to matter are impossible now. If you like cruise ships, that's over. You know, if you live in Venice, they're not coming back, sorry to tell you. <laughs> that. 
there is no normal. We're not going back to normal. And we don't want to go back to normal. There were many things about normal that weren't so good. Right? Inequality, economic distress. And of course, Italy has many normals that in the end we all agree that probably need fixing. <laughs> I live in Switzerland and we can say, yeah, we had a good normal, but the future isn't going back to this. I'm sorry to tell you, but there will be new normals. And we're going to live in a world of pivoting. Right? Great American word. We're turning around the ship, tourism, agriculture, right? Everything is turning around. I mean, this is basically a time for us to reinvent ourselves. Tourism is the hardest one, clearly. I think uh, Italy has great cards here, however. I'll talk more about that later. Uh, but the same goes for live events, conferences, rock concerts, movie theaters, right? airlines. You, know, you don't want to be in the shores of airlines now. Uh, automotive sector, that's right around Modena, on that whole area north of Modena. And between Milano and Modena is, of course, where all the big brands are, the manufacturers, and last not least, the fashion industry. Right? We have to think about how we can do things differently because a year and a half of ad adaptation and then a different consumer, a different mindset. And how are we going to go virtual without losing our soul, right? our reality, our, what we are and what we stand for. I mean, you can't eat on the internet, right? That's a very big deal in Italy. So. But here's some examples of adaptation, invention, pivoting. Here's the DJ that plays uh, a concert, uh, basically a drive-in concert, very popular in Denmark, also the US. Here is how people eat now, right? Uh, I hope not in Italy. <laughs> I would find that pretty strange, but people do that. The, the Tour de France went virtual. Here's a, a hotel that is renting out their rooms on a day rate, not for getting together, but for working from home, so to speak, right? Very smart idea. Here's myself. Now I go on virtual. This is what I do now. I show up on the screen. I think I look better in reality than that. Uh, and here's something really interesting. I want to actually play a short video for the a fashion show. Uh, from from Giac Giacomus, it's called the uh, the fashion brand, and this fashion show is happening in a cornfield, right? In a, in a feed, field of wheat, so people can keep their distance. Check it out. I mean, ingenious idea about pivoting and making something new out of this. So here's a short track with this. I mean, it's mind-boggling the inventiveness of uh, of this of this uh, industry sector. You may have seen this, and you can see it on the FF channel on YouTube. But so people are sitting there and uh, enjoying the cornfield <laughs> and, of course, the models. But, hey, what a great idea of pivoting, right? We're going to have to do more of that. What is your cornfield that you can go into in the future if you make cars, if you're a manufacturer, if you're in tourism, if you're a city? The city of Modena is looking at the right approach here. Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, putting me up here for this virtual conversation. So here's the hard part, right? Everybody's seen this. This is not new. But yeah, tourism is going to really suffer through this cutting back international tourists, of course. But there are solutions. Right? Here in Switzerland, you know, we're localizing uh, tourism. We're coming up with interesting packages. We're reaching out to neighboring countries. There's many, many things that we can do. Of course, I don't have a ready-made solution for this. But I think you know, Italian people are ingenious. Uh, of course, people in general tend to be ingenious in the tourism business and in restaurants. And I think we'll find a way forward here. So, generally speaking, we are in a world of VUCA. Right? You may have heard this before. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity is used in the military a lot, which I don't usually quote, but hey, makes sense here. It's, that's our future. Right? And how are we going to do that? Well, I think we have to what I call flip the VUCA. Turn it around. We have to be fast, velocity, unorthodox. Hey, that's something Italian. We can think about that. Co-creation and the good old American word awesomeness. Come up with great ideas. Now there's companies inventing things that work only because of this crisis. I mean, Airbnb is now doing virtual experiences. I don't know how that would feel, but hey, you know, Think of that idea as, a, as sort of a flip in the VUCA exercise. So this is something just to take home as a, as a way of approaching this crisis. You know, whatever you do, try to co-create, come up with ideas, do new things. And three headers here are orthodoxy, the most important, new ideas, things that you haven't thought of before. Ingenuity, inventing stuff on the fly. I think Leonardo da Vinci, right? I mean, you invented, what, 5,000 things? <laughs> Courage. And that's what we have to 
give each other, and we have to encourage each other to get through this because eventually something better, uh, better future will emerge, not a new, not back to the normal. Right? So let me talk about the key topic here of my presentation. Uh, the great transformation, technology, humanity, what does it mean? I mean we're moving into uh, transformation and hyperdrive, right? And the things that used to be on top, cars, traveling, flying, cruise ships, right? Again, big deal. It's moving to the bottom and vice versa, right? The things that are on the top now, what are the important things on the top? Well, education, remote learning, energy, the state, of course, anything you do with health and wellness and food, that has all moved to the top. Right? And we, we're looking at a whole different world now. Our priorities have changed. And this is very challenging, but it's also a giant opportunity to finally reset, for example, to a green economy. We have learned to cut back because of COVID and to make compromises. Are we going to do the same for climate change? And is that a ticket to our future? The World Economic Forum says there's hundreds of millions of new jobs in the green economy. I tend to agree. We have to make the right decisions. You know, we have to use this transformation as a catalyst. So there's four winners. Uh, well, actually, there's five, but I'm going to just list four here. <laughs> so uh, four winners of the current crisis that are going to continue to win on the stock market, probably, but also in general, big tech, right? Everything is about tech. Uh, so it's actually too big tech. I will talk about that shortly, what that means. Big health. Hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars, euros, are moving over into the healthcare space. The vaccine, bioengineering, biotechnology, convergence of, of biology and technology. And that's going to be a very fruitful place to work in. We're going to reallocate money there. We're going to drag the social sector into this. And America will finally, maybe next year, really have a public healthcare system. I'll talk more about that in a minute. That's, that's of course, a hopeful angle. And big state. Well, lots of people don't like big state because it feels overbearing, but this is what we have now. Right? When we have to find the state politicians that we can trust. Now, there's an oxymoron. Here in Switzerland, we trust the state. It's going really well. But think about Brazil. You know, people don't trust the state. Americans, you know, Italians. Well, there's a debating point for later. But big state is everywhere. And I think big green is the ticket. Right? I mean, if you're in the business of sustainability, renewable energy, uh, sustainable vacations, tourism, ecotourism. I think this is where we had it like really quick. And, and in Europe, we're using the COVID crisis to think about this, how we can actually address climate change. Many countries, it's the opposite. Brazil or India, they're saying, you know, basically, okay, let's, we have bigger things to do now than to also think about climate change. But think about this logic. Right? If you can make sacrifices because of a pandemic, if you can be told by the state what to do and by the police, because there's an emergency. Would you do the same for climate change? Are you willing to pay a carbon tax on airline flights, not take your car into the city? Right? I mean, these are things that we're going to have to do, basically sacrifices, compromises. And they will generate a huge amount of new business and new work if we get our agenda right. So, as a Star Trek fan, of course, we're going basically warp drive into the future. I mean, we are in a situation where it's not just fast anymore. Right? It's mind-boggling fast. And we have to get used to this. Basically, my kids will live in a world that's going to be so exponentially different. They, they will live to be 100 on average. The kids of my kids may live to be 120. I right? mean, think about this for a second. Exponential change, 4, 8, 16, 32, every 12 months, a leap. I mean, the world in 10 years will be more different than the world if we go back a hundred years compared to today. Right? I mean, the changes we're going to see that we have to be aware of them and we need people with wisdom to be our guides. Right? We need every politician, every public official and every CEO and every futurist, of course, right, to have a driver's license for the future, right, to understand where this is going. And I think this is becoming crucial now because we have to make decisions every single day. Look at healthcare. Right? I mean, the combination of data and science and analytics and maybe AI. Can we do better with healthcare? Can we actually make it healthcare, not sick care? Can we prevent diseases? Can we customize and personalize medi Medicare and medical devices? Can we use better diagnostics, cloud biology, better food? Yeah, of course we can. 
And I have great hope that the convergence of technology and biology will create a healthcare system that is affordable and that is accessible and that will also deal with the digital divide. Now that's, of course, going up, tele telemedicine and telehealth. I foresee a time in the future where 80 to 90 percent of doctor visits that we have today are, are not no longer needed because we can do it through devices like the Apple Watch, but, you know, there are many other devices apart from the Apple Watch. But we're going to see a huge explosion here in the next couple of years. Working from home, same thing. This is going to explode. Not everybody has a fancy setup like this. Uh, I think the reality is probably more like this, <laughs> right? <laughs> Where we're saying, oh my God, I have to like do double duty. Uh, and this is, I'm sure, quite familiar with you. But here's the good news, right? We're going hybrid as far as work is concerned. Work from home, work, work from home, work from the cafe, work from the beach. What I've always done, really. Right? Maybe not work too much, maybe work less. But human relationships, age to age, human to human, in the flesh, in the meat space, as some people call it, I have a good laugh about that one, are becoming more valuable. Just because we use these devices doesn't mean we, we are going to forget what it's like. Yeah, these are tools. We're going to use the tools and we're going to go hybrid. If you don't know how to do that, you'll be in deep trouble. But things like education, yeah, we can learn things online, but really the learning happens between people when we get together. Why people go to MIT? Why do they go to MIT when they can watch all their courses online? Because of the experience. Keep in mind when we think about working from home, the way that the human brain is wired, right? Experiences, relationships, engagement. As long as we're human, we're going to look for that. Right? And that's, by the way, a great ticket for tourism, the future of tourism, just to lean back to this. So we are in an amazing time, right? the largest technological transformation in human history. All this stuff being invented at the same time, I think this is really exciting, possibly overbearing, but talk about overbearing, take a look at this one. 2050, many of my colleagues like Ray Kurzweil say, we're going to reach a point to where machines have potentially the same power possibilities than us. Whatever that means, I don't think machines will ever have emotional intelligence or exist right, in that sentience or sapiens wisdom. Right? But they will be pretty damn smart <laughs> and they will do many things for us. And in 2050, we have to be ready. We have to think about what that means and what we want them to do and what they should not do. Probably that's a much more important question as to what they should not do. So here's my key point on technology in the future. I think we will have all the tools we need to solve practical problems. Water, food, energy, right? disease. But will we have the wisdom? Will we make the right decisions? That is the key point. We have the tools, but hey, you can use a hammer to kill somebody or can use it to build a house. I can use AI in the future, not me, but people can use AI to kill people. And so what are the rules and social contracts governing all of this? We have to put a lot more energy into that and not just say, well, we're going to use this because it works. That will get us to the very same point that we're at right now with Facebook. Just as an example, what used to be good has now become an AI-driven uh, marketing machine, a data engine right? where we are the content. I left Facebook two years ago for that very reason. I'm not going back, and I think it's becoming unethical just, just to actually you know, be part of it. So anyway, different discussion. We'll take more questions on that later. Yeah. Here's the important point. Putting the human inside. We should always have humans in the loop. We should always make sure that it's the human benefit that counts, not the monetary benefit. That's not the same thing. Right? There are other human benefits that are not about money. <laughs> we should make sure the combination of people, planet, purpose, prosperity, uh, purpose being the key word here, that is becoming the future of technology. Right? So exponential technological progress brings up an important question. That question is, well, yeah, it's great, but is there such a thing as too much of a good thing? So enter my friend Elon Musk, parenthesis. Right? Elon has invented a thing called the Neuralink. Uh, which he tried, to, he, he demoed the other day with pigs. Basically an implant in the brain that sends out signals where uh, the pig can be uh, communicating and, so to speak, also control their limbs. You know, it's, it's meant to help paraplegics and so on, but it's a long story. Let me play the short clip for you. I think you'll find it quite entertaining. 
And then after that, a short quote from Elon Musk himself. Three little piggies. Gotta check it out on YouTube. But here is a question from the audience. I think you'll find this revealing. Uh, another question from Twitter. Will you be able to save and replay memories in the future? Uh, yes, I think uh, in the future you will be able to save and re replay memories. Um, I mean, this is obviously sounding increasingly like a Black Mirror episode. Um, but, uh, <laughs> well, I guess we're pretty good at predicting. Um, so here it kind of shows, you know, what is the business model? Yeah, it's backing up the human brain. I mean, we see lots of TV shows about this. Yeah, too much of a good thing. <laughs> you know, that's say, okay, Elon, keep going and, and good luck with all the stuff that you're doing. But this is really far out in my view. Possibly the idea of being a superhuman uh, or living forever. I mean, let's be real about this for a second. The other thing that's really interesting uh, is uh, something that Facebook has just launched with, with Oculus Rift called the Infinite Office. And of course, there's good timing for this when you think about the current COVID isolation and not going out. And this is probably going to come back for most of next year. Uh, now we can do this. Right? We can virtually live at home and do all that stuff. And what good timing for this product. And I don't know whether to laugh or, how to, or, or to cry. Um, I think this could be fantastic. It could, in fact, be so good that I would get totally hooked on it. And I think a lot of people feel that, that way about virtual reality. But where is it going to take us? Eh? And I think this is my hunch of where it's going to take us. Right? It's going to take us to a place of constant evolution where we are no longer capable of functioning without it. Right? Where we are so networked that we can't get out of bed without the connection. Then you're going to end up with a Great show on Amazon called Upload, if you can watch it on Amazon Prime, that does exactly this story. But we have to think about what that means. You know, Marshall McLuhan, the famous media theor theorist and also futurist, of course, great uh, influence on my work, he said, we shape our tools and thereafter they shape us. That was 60 years ago. I don't want these tools to shape me. I don't know about you, but I'm also going to put a second quote here from Marshall says, all extensions of man and woman are also amputations. When we add something that makes us more powerful, we also remove something. And what would we be removing when we use virtuality all day long? Well, it's kind of like what our world would be really boring afterwards. Uh, it's kind of like a, a, a giant expansion that amputates pretty much everything else. I think we need to be very careful about this. We need to use it for the benefits, health, technology, medical. Right? But how about the things that are too much of a good thing? Great show on Netflix, The Social Dilemma. Okay? It's available in Italian. Here I want to play a short sample so you can see it. This is what every... Questo è quello che ogni impresa ha sempre sognato. To have a... Avere la garanzia that if che se viene inserita una pubblicità avrà successo. È così che fanno affari, vendendo certezza. Yeah, they sell certainty, right? Selling certainty, that's what technology does. Take a look at this movie, I think you'll be quite impressed. I really think we need to do this. Right? We need to make sure that every person that is involved in making those decisions, especially in social media and other media, right, has a what I call technocratic oath. It has to give us a technocratic oath, like a doctor, right, who gives us an oath to do the right thing and to always look out for the benefit of his patients. Who's looking out for the benefit of the users? What is the oath? I mean, clearly we're going to need responsibility. We need a Hippocratic oath for technology. Right? We need to think about something like a council of ethics right? that is beyond the business purposes. And I've suggested this in my book, which is available in Italian, but I've done that for years and finally we have some. We have one in Singapore, we have one in Denmark. Maybe we should have one in Modena and in Italy at large. Right? What is ethical technology? This is going to be an important question because right now technology is so limited still by what it can actually do well, but 10 years, the sky is the limit. This is a big question. Not what we can do with technology, but what do we want to do? Right? Great uh, quote here from Tim Coxey of Apple, right, who says, 
Technology can do great things, but it does not want to do great things. It doesn't want anything. Technology is neutral. It doesn't have an agenda. It has code. It doesn't live. Right? If we want something with technology, if we want to have a good life, in the future, if we want equality, if we want to live in an equal country, if we want to solve problems, we need to make our own decisions. Right? We need to inject ethics. And what makes it worse is that technology is basically everything now. I mean, technology is eating up all the other industries, telecom, banking, financial services, healthcare, pharma, transportation, everything is becoming technology. <laughs> So imagine what will happen in 10 years when technology is up the exponential scale and other 10 steps. We're talking basically in the neighborhood of 500x and in, in, you know, 10G and 10 billion people on the internet. Uh, we're going to need to think about what technology is supposed to do and what it's not. And what are, what are its limits? And, and we have to ask why, not just how. Today we're saying, well, you know, how does it work? How do I get my movie to stream properly? Or how does 5G work or any of those things? But the future is going to be about why. Why are we doing this? Is it good for us? And who's in charge? Is it the users in charge or is it the platforms in charge? We're moving into the future, what I call the mega shifts. It's a big topic in my book. You can actually download the third chapter of my book for free at megashifts.digital. Not to promote the book, this is a great resource. And it's available in Italian, megashifts.digital. And so all of these things, automation, uh, robotization, cognification, smart machines, you know, the stuff that we talk about every day without getting too geeky and meme slinging here, right? Uh, this is going to explode. Right? I mean, basically, the world is going to change more in the next 10 years than the previous 100 years. Right? And, and it's technology that drives it. But technology drives it and ethics defines it. It's the why question. The purpose is what defines it. That's what should define it. You know? Today we also have this question a lot where we say, well, we're defined by the fact that it's just working, right? So it's working, I'm happy. But we have to go further. When we think about technology like smart machines, so-called thinking machines, there is no such thing as a thinking machine. Right? Smart machines, yes. Read Stuart Russell's book, Benevolent uh, AI, I think it's called, or Human human, whatever, AI, but <laughs> just look at Stuart Russell. Great book about AI, and he talks about what AI actually is. It is not like us, it is what we are. Right? We are in a universe of many things that we do, like foresight, curiosity, purpose, passion. Can you imagine a passionate computer? That will really take us into science fiction. <laughs> Critical thinking, I mean, a computer can't think about what may happen in the future apart from of course, projecting and using numbers, but understanding, wisdom, context. I think maybe in 30 years we can get there. And that's the scary part. You know, until, we, until then, this is what your kids have to learn. right? Your kids have to learn, sorry, purpose. Right? I mean, if you have kids, you've got to teach them about passion, about imagination, about curiosity, right? about critical thinking. And this is the people that we should hire. That's our future. Our future is not to compete with the machines on facts and logic. Right? Yeah, our future is clearly this, it's about existence. Right? It's about sapience, wisdom. Right? And you know, a lot of in my work I use this term called phronesis, right? which is practical wisdom, you know? applying wisdom to what we can solve. You know? I think humanity on top of technology. So, I use this topic a lot, you know, when I speak about humans and machines, you know, we have to get away from this concept that we need to gear up to compete with machines. I call that machine thinking right? or dataism. You know, everything is driven by data. We're not machines. I don't believe we are machines. Some people do. But hence, I don't believe that we would be upgradable and that we should upgrade ourselves. Let's talk about, as we move on to the Final part of the presentation will be next, you know, next two hours. Just kidding. Uh, about geopolitics and what's happening here, and right? I mean, uh, to put it in a sort of very simplified way, we're living in three worlds now: uh, the American world, which is extreme capitalism. You can see how far that has gotten them. Uh, corporate capitalism, uh, right now edging towards civil war. I used to live in America for a long time. This is a tough one. I'm quite concerned about that. Europeans, history, culture, 
humanism. Uh, that's our blue flag here. I'm proud of that flag, but yeah, that also means that sometimes we're not the fastest. Right? And of course, China, right? What's China all about? State capitalism, <laughs> surveillance, AI. Not to say that's all a bad thing, but yeah, these are, these are world differences in opinion. And where are we going with this? I think Europe needs to be very strong on the philosophy that we have here in Europe, which is social capitalism. And I'm so glad that the Commission is pushing this agenda, finding solidarity with Italy. Yes, I know many of the terms may not be to everybody's liking, but God, have, has the Commission turned around? Has Europe turned around? Just in the last three months, has Merkel turned around? I mean, I'm German, but I have to say that's pretty impressive. I think we're going to get somewhere with this. We're not perfect with Europe, but yeah, I think right now this, this is where I expect most of the change. I'm a proud European. I think we have solutions for many, many things. What we don't have is sometimes the vigorous enterprising spirit and the pioneering that you have in California and the huge amount of control that people have over data and populations in China. But this is the future. The United States of Europe. I know this sounds like a crazy idea right now when we have all of these issues. <laughs> But what's going to happen if we don't collaborate the next couple of years? We're going to have to really figure out how to get together, how to become one in the sense of United States, but separate states, separate languages, cultures. Right? But we, we could save trillions of euros for common defense. Right? So the United States of Europe will emerge by 2030. And I'll talk to you again about that when, when it's time. Hopefully that part of it will be uh, trackable. Talking about America, what a mess. But we're going to see a pivot in America this year, maybe next year. Right? The ship is turning around. I wrote a story on this a couple of days ago. Uh, you can find it at thefutureof.us, uh, uh, foretelling URL. But I have great hopes for that happening next year. Right now it's a mess, but I think that we're going to see a pivoting of America coming back with a Democratic president, a Democratic Congress even. And a woman as a leader, well, second in command, but soon to be a leader. And have you noticed, by the way, that so many countries who are won by women are doing the best in this pandemic? New Zealand, Taiwan, Switzerland to some degree, Germany, Finland, Iceland. Why is that? <laughs> well, we go for emotional intelligence, right? So let me talk about climate change and talk about why that is an opportunity, not just a challenge, right? You may have seen this, you know, San Francisco was in the cloud of orange smoke uh, just about three weeks ago, uh, two weeks ago, and it was like apocalypse. I mean, this is some footage that was widely spread around the internet. And, and so when we talk about climate change, right, it's, it's quite clear COVID-19 is just a trial run for climate change. I and mean, you think that COVID-19 is a tough one, it is. Right? But dealing with climate change, and the consequences of climate change, it's a thousand X of what we have now. This is an existential issue. I'm not going to preach much about this with numbers. You've seen all the numbers. I just think that we have to reboot and say, well, if we want a world that we can live in, yes, maybe we do need more carbon taxes on airplanes, on meat, on cars. I know that sounds like a crazy idea, given that we already feel like we pay too much taxes and nobody wants to pay extra taxes. Right? But think about this, right? If we are going to make a difference and change the way that we're doing things, how are we going to do this? Who wants to pay taxes voluntarily? I think the unthinkable is becoming the new normal. And so let's unthink, right? so we can discover what the new normal is. And this is happening all around us. I mean, the unthinkable is that the state is going to tell me that I have to wear a mask to go to a restaurant. That was like a year ago, that would have been Japan. But voluntarily. Huh? And today it's, yeah, we're, we're accepting it because it has to be done. Similar things are going to happen right here with what I call, what's been called the circular economy, right? This whole concept of giving back and not, not just recycling, right? generally speaking, by giving back materials and putting back what we have taken and taken the externalities and, and, and using those uh, to replenish them. I mean, clearly, I think the circular economy will be the economy, will be all of the economy in 2030. So if, you, if your business model includes circular economy and sustainability, I think you're on the right way there. You know, clearly, we're looking at these three different 
tracks right now, the waves of change, you know, public health and COVID, climate change falling right after that. And the third big wave is the rethinking of the economic logic, a sustainable capitalism. And this is all shaping up right now. I mean, these are giant opportunities for our well-being, for our future, and also for prosperity. They create jobs if we set our minds to it. These are challenges, these are opportunities, they are both at the same time. They are a crisis that we can't waste. To get our world going again, right, this, we have to step in the right direction and do this. Right? We have to go to a new narrative. And, th and this is what's important. That new narrative is this one. Right? By investing in food, land, infrastructure, and to nature. What the World Economic Forum has researched is roughly the same money that we're spending globally on stimulus packages, 2.3 trillion. If we spend a little bit more than that, we can create 390 million new jobs by 2030. By putting the money in the right place, by making the Green Deal the center of everything. And I think this would be amazing for Italy. I mean, there's so many am amazing companies in Italy that are already following in this, in, in this direction, that are already pulling everybody in this direction as well. This new narrative is going to be crucial, I think, for our future. Two stories here. On the left, technology. Clearly, that is going to be what we have to take as a, as a landmark. Right? Exponential, convergent, the power of technology. Right next to that, humanity. Holistic business models, circular economy, and human benefit. Not human-centered in the Anthropocene kind of way, right? but human in terms of the benefit that we're receiving. I think if you write that on your flag for the future, post with COVID, we don't know when post COVID is, that would be the right direction. You know, the landscape of money around us, of capitalism, has quite clearly failed to take care of many things that it should take care of. And I think we're moving into a world where we're going to see what I call the quadruple bottom line. And that's been written, uh, written and talked about for 20 years, including, of course, Al Gore and others. Right? And there's even a book called People, Planet uh, Purpose, People, Planet Profit, I think. Um, I call this People, Planet Purpose and Prosperity. And this is what's shaping up in the, uh, uh, on the agenda right now. This is kind of a beyond GDP thinking, huh? beyond gross domestic product or GNP, whatever you want to call it. Kennedy already said that, Bobby Kennedy, 1967. GDP measures everything except for that that makes life worthwhile. Life is beyond one thing. Uh, and this is really becoming obvious in the crisis right now. So as we're pivoting, as we're moving around and, and trying to figure out what the next step is, four central things that you can expect in the next 10 years, we're going to move towards equitable and just societies. And this is not just a wishful thinking, this is our survival program. This is something we need to do to get to the next level, a kind of sustainable capitalism. Well, wow, that's a lot to be defined. That will take the next five days to explain, but really decisive action and sacrifices on climate change. I mean, I fly a lot. I used to fly a lot. Uh, if I ever fly again, yeah, I'd be happy to pay a tar carbon tax the same price on the ticket if I have to. I think we need to think really dramatic and, 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 and really not spare ideas here. And of course, a strong public health care system. Lots of money will go into this. Lots of new jobs will be generated there. So let me give you some final thoughts, and then I will take some uh, YouTube uh, common questions. Unfortunately, we don't have a live feed here. But let's not ask this question anymore. What will the future bring? There is no such thing. The future isn't fixed. It's not falling down from the sky from Silicon Valley or China. It's not made by Microsoft, Google, Apple, Facebook, whoever, Tencent. The future is created by us. We make the future. We decide what we want. We make choices. The key question that you should be asking for the future, especially in Italy, is this question. What kind of future do we want? What choices do you want to make? Where do you want to put the money? Who's going to make those decisions? Who's going to take you to that future? Right. That is the future because we will literally have every possible choice. It's hard to imagine today because we're in dire straits right now. In 10 years, technology will give us the answer for everything. Upload your brain if you, if you find life boring. 
get a robot boyfriend, girlfriend. Right? I mean, what kind of future do we want for ourselves and for our country and for the world? Leonardo da Vinci, the Vitruvian Man, the, I think it's a Homo Vitruviano, right? The Vitruvian Man as a symbol of how we are connected to everything around us and the symbol of the Renaissance, of course. Right? And now we're having a new Renaissance. And this is what's surrounding us now, technology. Mind-boggling AI, the Internet of Things, 3D printing, mind-boggling possibilities and solutions, the key to our future in so many ways. But technology will not fix social, cultural or political problems. That's up to us. That's us up to, up to everybody. And the, I call this the Neoluvian man, Neoluvian woman, right? The uh, Donna Neoluviana, right, I suppose. I think we're going into the future where we're going to see a new human renaissance. An awakening of people saying, you know what, this is great to have, but what does it do? And what, shouldn't it, what should it not do? Right? I mean, let's be honest about this. You know, we all want to achieve combinations of people, planet, purpose, and prosperity in different levels. Right? We're going to have to come, on, come onto the same agenda here with 10 billion people connected to the Internet in probably less than 10 years. So as my final quote... I think right now is the time to shape your future or be shaped by it. And this is a great opportunity for a reset, a great transformation that we're seeing around us right now. So thanks for your time.